Welcome to the Psychology Live Studio. I'm Sam Gosling. And I'm Jamie Pennebaker. We're really excited about a lot of the features of our course, and we're going to tell you about some of them right now. And one of them is we will periodically interview world famous experts who tell us about different features of psychology. And uh, I think you'll enjoy the one we're about to show. Yes, go ahead, take a look. What drew you into the research? In, in terms of this whole work on et race, ethnicity, and so forth. Well, I mean, I think the obvious thing is that, um, so I don't know if you noticed, Jamie, but I am black. I picked that up. I picked that up, and now I, I will openly acknowledge that. I think that's an important yeah. lesson. If yeah. you take anything away from today, that's the one. Yeah. But um, in general, you know, so my race and my ethnicity really did play a big role in terms of my interest in this topic because it's something that, that affected my existence um, for the most part every day. But how about in your childhood? Yeah, well, actually, when I was a kid, I grew up in Detroit, or sorry, I was born in Detroit, but I grew up in Troy, which is a suburb of Detroit. And um, the suburb of Detroit that I went to was a majority white suburb. So there weren't a lot of other kids who were black or of any other ethnicity around me. Um, but at that point in time, I had sort of a different experience from the rest of my family, some of my cousins that grew up in Detroit. And I got an opportunity to sort of see a comparison and contrast. And I think a lot of people don't necessarily get that. So the, um, the questions that I had growing up were really questions that I've had for a very long time. And um, when I went to college, I actually got exposed to this idea that you can study these things empirically, right, scientifically even, to try to get an understanding about the ways in which race, ethnicity, gender, other dimensions of people's um, group memberships can have an influence on how they're judged. Do you, you feel that in our culture that <laughs> feelings about race and ethnicity have been shifting over the last 10 years. It's been a fascinating time. The fact that we have an African American president, do you think there's less issues of racism, more? What, what what do you think's happened? I think, um, so for the most part, there's a lot of debate about this sort of, about this in the literature, in the research literature. And the case is, or at least it seems to be the case, that there's definitely a lot less explicit prejudice, a lot less explicit, like, explicit racism um, discrimination that's out there. So people are less likely to want to talk about it. They're less likely to actually do things, particularly when they're in contexts or situations when other people can be evaluating them. But um, that means that the implicit kinds of biases that we have become even more important because now those subtle biases, those little things that are essentially gut reactions that can snowball into bigger kinds of implications, those are the things that tend to be influencing people's outcomes a little bit more these days. But it doesn't mean that explicit prejudice has gone away. So again, um, you know, the, the debate and the discussion about having a, an African American president, mm -hmm. that's important, right? It's a milestone in our, in, our, um, in our history. But at the same time, it's not um, uh, you know, an indication that things are fine. There's still a great deal of prejudice and stereotyping. Some of it is explicit, just like in the old days, but a lot of it is implicit as well. And again, my perspective is that we need to understand both types in order to make any change in society. One of the issues that's been of interest, I think, to people in, uh, in Texas that is the fact that here we're in, in the South, the kind of the West-South uh, part of the world, and there's often, for example, when I go to Massachusetts, people assume that we're all racist down here. Yeah. Do you, do, you, do you view that there are these big differences in terms of kind of day-to-day -day interactions in terms of race between uh, the South and, the, and uh, the Northeast? Yeah, what a lot of people have reported is that in the South, there's, there's a slight tendency for racism to be more that explicit kind of racism, that overt racism, where you see more um, overt sort of segregation, what have you, and that, um, in a sense, people talk about that in the South is being um, somewhat preferable. So when you talk to people who are members of minority groups and they talk about what's going on in the South, they contrast it by saying, well, you know, in the North, you're never really sure what people are thinking of you. So in general, they don't feel like they could say something about you, but they're thinking it and they feel it, but they won't say so. In the South, they're much more likely to be upfront about it. And in a way, that's a little bit more comfortable for people because they know where they stand with other people. So in a lot of ways, the stress associated with you know, discrimination, that stress can be just as um, strong if it's this sort of overt, explicit discrimination that you get in the South as it is in the North where you have this sort of, this, this, um, sort of covert discrimination. So where do you see the hot research going in terms of race and, and stereotyping? Well, it's funny. So I, I have a couple different perspectives. So one perspective is, um, 
uh, you know, researchers tend to want to study things and study things and study things to understand them more and more and never feel like they've learned enough in order to do anything about it. So I think there's going to be a lot of research that goes on in terms of helping to develop our theoretical understanding of these things. But um, at the same time, I think a lot of research needs to be done that looks a little bit more at some of the practical implications. So now, given what we think we know about these particular topics, can we try to use this information to have interventions in different kinds of contexts? So can we go into schools and try to do something about the kinds of racial or gender problems problems that, um, that lead to the kinds of outcomes that we don't like in schools, like underperformance, dropping out, things like that. Can we use what we know about social psychology and, frankly, other disciplines as well? Because, again, we're just scratching the surface of social psych, but there are lots of other disciplines that have different perspectives on the exact same problem. And I think in the future, what we're going to be doing is thinking a little bit more about how we can do research to make change, to apply them into different contexts of importance. OK. Jason, do you have questions from the students out there? Yeah. Uh, Keith? There's been so, uh, several questions that kind of hit at this issue about is racism totally an acquired phenomenon or is there any biological aspect that you know of? Mm. I wouldn't necessarily say that racism is uh, is um, wholly biological or wholly acquired, right? So it's always a little bit of both. Um, but the, the part of it that is biological is that we're all essentially human beings that have the same brain, right? And the brain for the most part, does the same thing in each one of us. There's lots of individual variability, of course, even in that task that you did. There's some people who were showing a lot of bias with respect to the distinction between um, the positive versus negative associations with blacks, and there are other people who show less bias, and maybe even the reverse. So there's variability that's going to take place there. But in general, that tendency is something that is built in. We all have the same brains. We're hardwired to kind of process information in certain ways, and that Processing is kind of a consequence, it's a byproduct of the brains that we have. So in some sense, it kind of goes to this idea of talking about people as being racist and that there's something about them. And that's true, but it's a combination of how they're wired, but also in terms of their upbringing, the kinds of experiences they have. And I think any psychologist or any scientist would definitely wouldn't want to rule out the fact that we have some determination, right? We have some ability to determine our outcomes besides just our biology. So. Um, in general, you know, one thing I like to think about is that, you know, just because my eyesight is going to decline over time, it doesn't mean that I'm destined to not do anything about that. I can think, as a human being, we've developed ways to try to curb that natural tendency for eyesight to decline by coming up with glasses, coming up with the contact lenses. So we're smart enough as a species to overcome some of the more natural tendencies that we might have. That, that strikes me when I was looking at the questions that were coming up uh, after the IAT, this idea that, uh, so if you were much slower on the the, the one where you you're pairing black and good yeah. Does that mean that you, therefore, are a naturally prejudiced person? It sounds like you're saying, no, not at all. Yeah, I would think that, and again, that task, there's some debate about what that task actually means. But again, the, the, the most standard interpretation is that it is a reflection of the environment in which you've been exposed to, the kinds of associations that you've built up. So almost in the same sense that you think of, you know, when I say bacon, you think eggs, in the same sense that you've built up that association over time, these are the kinds of associations that we build up with people of different racial and ethnic groups, people of different gender. And a lot of that, it's not that it's illusory, right? Those things are out there. But we often have to question why they're out there, right? So it's questions about whether or not people have natural tendencies to, let's say, not achieve well in society. Let's say they're lazy, the kinds of stereotypic traits that we have. And we often underestimate, as a social psychologist, I'd have to point out that we underestimate the role that context and situation plays in shaping people's outcomes and shaping people's <coughs> opportunities. And so when you forget about the context and you forget about the outcomes and you just look at the two people and you see one is achieving and one's not, then you're doing a disservice because there's an entire more, or much more complex story that led to those two individuals having different outcomes. Keith, it has been a joy having you here. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you so great. much. And uh, this is Jamie Pennebaker. And Keith Maddox. And uh, we will see you again very soon. <laughs>